So when we're talking about observations in a specific time and place, let's start with place. And we'll start with place broad and we'll bring place down to very specific. And we could really pinpoint this because we might need to know where this cloud is. And we might need to know generally to warn people. And then we might need to know very specifically where that is. So to start broad, we can use the sun and we can use cues from vegetation to help us to know where north is. And if we know where north is, we can figure out where east, south, and west are. So um, in the morning, you can certainly use the sun on a sunny day to know where um, where north is. If you have your right hand pointed at the sun in the morning, then you are going to be facing the north, right? When your right arm is pointing toward the sun in the morning, you are facing north. And when your left arm in the afternoon is pointing toward the sun as it is in the west, then your left arm is pointing toward the west and you are facing north. So that's a way to use the sun in the afternoon and in the morning on sunny days. But what if it's midday or what if it's cloudy? You can still use cues from vegetation to know where north is. And for instance, if you're in an area that is that is um, has a lot of trees in it, look for moss on the trees. Moss will always grow on the side of the tree that is more shaded, and the more shaded side is the northern side. So on trees, you can look for moss on the north side of the tree, and usually dry bark on the south side of the tree, and. If you are in a hilly area, you can confirm this north-south direction by looking at the top of the hill and looking at both sides of the hill. On the southern facing slope, you will have grasses and you will have some deciduous or um, trees that lose their leaves on the southern side, which is a drier side that gets more sun. There's the deciduous trees that would normally lose their leaves with the seasons. Here's the grass on the south slope. On the northern slope, you're going to have evergreens that are grow taller because there's more shade and more moisture there and a lot more ground vegetation. So really good cues from the sun and from the earth to know directions. And in terms of that, um, we can get very specific as well. And we can get specific talking about place by talking about place in the entire world, um, the entire 360 degree sphere around the world. When we talk about this sphere, we can talk about the entire world in terms of the degrees that the sphere takes up. The Earth rotates around its polar axis, the axis that runs from North to South Pole, and it takes this 360 degrees only 24 hours to spin once. So in terms of that, we can use that information that you can do a 360 degree turn in 24 hours. That's a fast spin. And that's about a thousand miles an hour at the equator. If you think about that, one of the reasons why the equator is a little bit bulgier and wider than the pole distance is very similar to a skater's um, skirt. So while she, while she is skating slowly, her skirt is down. When she starts to rotate very quickly, her skirt flattens out, much the way the Earth has a bulge, a flattening at the equator. You see the bulge right here? It's called a um, geodinal bulge there, and it's a little bit less distance from North Pole to South Pole. We can use these degrees to tell, diff, um, to tell um, 
um, locations very precisely. Let's look into how to do that. Those degrees can go into lines that move from North Pole to South Pole, longitudinal lines. This is just a review for you. And those longitudinal lines are called meridians. They're called meridians. They're from the word that means midday, meridian. Meridi, merid is mid, and of course, dian is day. So why are they called meridians for midday? Well, the highest the, the highest point for the sun is at midday, and midday will be at the same exact time anywhere along a line or a meridian. So in other words, if midday, the highest point of the sun, is at 1213 in New York, along the same meridian at the equator, the highest point point of the sun at midday is going to be at 1213. And down in New Zealand, the same time will have the same highest point for the sun. Now the sun will not be at the same angle in all three places. The sun is going to be highest at the equator and it's going to be lower at, in New York and it's going to be lower in New Zealand, but it will be at its highest point for the day at this meridian, um, at, at this meridian line um, along the horizon. So that helps you to understand a little bit why they called it a midday or meridian line. These lines go from north to south pole all the way around the 360 degrees, and that is rotating. Roughly half of this rotation will be in daylight hours or with the sun, and roughly half of this sphere will be in nighttime hours or will be dark. So in the same way, with this rotation, we can divide the Earth into hemispheres. Hemi meaning half, right? We can divide the Earth in two, which is roughly daylight side versus nighttime side, and those Hemispheres, half spheres, will be about 180 degrees each. 180 degrees around there for the Western Hemisphere, 180 degrees around here for the Eastern Hemisphere. We're starting to get more precise here for locations. Now, there are meridians all over the, um, all over the Earth. But the prime meridian, the primo meridian, has been claimed by the British because they'll claim all of these things and they really ruled the seas in the 1800s while this was all being developed. So they decided to take what's called the prime meridian, which is known as zero degrees there. So I'll review for you. And anything that is west of the prime meridian is known as the western hemisphere. And anything east of the prime meridian is known as the eastern hemisphere. Now, when we look at this, we're looking at 180 degrees for the western hemisphere and this is 10 degrees west, 20, 30, 40. When you want to look at New York, you're looking for New York at about 77 degrees west on the globe. So we're getting a little bit more precise here with our locations and our places. How are we going to remember that longitude is the long line between poles? Well, you can think about it as, um, you know, the row, 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 row your boat song. You know, merrily, 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 we roll along, right? So you think about merrily as in meridian and long as in longitudinal. So that's how you might be able to know a little bit more about and remember a little bit more about longitudinal lines and meridians. And in terms of that, when we look at meridians, we are looking at lines that go from pole to pole 
And that means the distance between these meridians can change because all of the meridians come together at the poles. And so these distances between the meridians near the poles are quite tight. You can see here, this is a shorter distance than the distance around the equator where they tend to bulge out to their farthest place at their farthest circumference around the equator. So these meridians have a um, distance that varies and this 111 kilometers is roughly about 69 miles distance wide at the equator. But you get up to the poles and there's no distance at all because all these meridians are meeting. So I hope this helps you out with longitude. Next, we're going to be talking about longitude and its impact on time for locating some of these uh, phenomena.